Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One the consultancy that helps companies create value from data to accelerate growth. And our guest today is James Malley, co-founder and CEO of Pacurit. Pacurit provides containerization technology to the supply chain community that reduces cost, waste, and carbon consumption. In this talk, we discussed how trends towards higher product mix, e-commerce, and sustainability awareness are impacting packaging and shipping. We also explored how 3D Smart packing APIs can be used to tactically upgrade existing WMS and TMS systems to reduce shipping and labor costs. If you find these conversations valuable, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. And if you'd like to share your company's story or recommend a speaker, you can email us at team at iot1.com. Finally, if you have an IoT research, strategy, or training initiative that you'd like to discuss, please email me directly at erik.walenza at iot1.com. Thank you. James, good afternoon. Nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So James, um, I always love talking to entrepreneurs that are in kind of very vertical or very, you know, let's say use case-based companies because it's always extremely clear what you do as opposed to sometimes I'm talking to people that are in kind of these horizontal, you know, we can work with anybody in the world and um, which it, it could be great businesses, but uh, always for me as a, as a host, a little bit more challenging. So looking forward to yeah, understanding the problem space here. That's funny. That, that may have come out of uh, we, my co-founder and I have a history in freelance development. And so maybe um, the years of kind of punishing, having to work on a wide variety of projects, um, we want, you know, when we sort of went out to solve a problem, we wanted it to be fairly specific. Yeah, right. So that was with, um, you have Benny Ship and Benny Flix. Um, and I guess it would be, would it be Benny Ship that is the, the freelance uh, DevOps company? That's right. Yeah, that was where the kind of company name for all the freelance work we did for shipping technology companies. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So you basically, they would come to you with a problem and say, we need a, a solution for X and you would help them to develop the MVP or maybe even the, the live, the kind of the, the full product. Yeah, it was a mix. I mean, um, 2009 is when we, Pat and I took our first, uh, you know, contract job for a, a shipping software provider. Um, and then kind of like most people in supply chain or supply chain tech, like once you do one, you just kind of get sucked into this space. Um, and so it was a mix. I mean, we did a lot of, you know, freelance, weird integration projects that nobody else wanted to touch. Um, we, towards the end, we got commissioned to build a fully fledged web-based shipping system. So we were kind of all over the place. And then I guess, was it kind of through that process where you were just continuously encountering ideas and eventually you you came upon one. I mean, it's always interesting to understand the the logic behind starting a company because you have, to some extent, infinite options ahead of you, <laughs> and then you have to choose one, right? So how, how do you make that choice? Uh, what to yeah. focus on? Well, a whole kind of bunch of different things converged. One was our kind of getting burnt out on putting out other people's fires and just wanting to own something, frankly, just wanting to have our own IP um, that we could have. And uh, at that same time, you know, FedEx and UPS started penalizing poor packing. And so we had all these developed all these relationships over the years with e-commerce companies and other shippers that said, well, wait a second, I'm getting absolutely hammered now on my carrier invoices, um, trying to see if my existing software can help me figure out how to pack things efficiently. Uh, it's not working. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't say we looked around a whole lot. We kind of just listened to the common refrain, which was about this problem. And so we set out to fix it. Yeah, I'd love to learn a little bit more about that. So what was the policy change? Was it just a, a pricing model change that they uh, enacted? Kind of. They, you know, historically the carriers, you know, FedEx, UPS, but also, you know, a lot of the regional and up-and-comer carriers, they charge just based on weight. Um, so, you know, back before e-commerce was so, you know, crazy, so huge, um, 
you would more often just get these big boxes with a tiny thing rattling around in it because there was no financial repercussions for kind of packing in a haphazard way. Um, You know, the idea of penalizing for poor packing, the way the carriers look at it was instead of just saying, we'll charge based on density, they said, we'll come up with a new definition of weight uh, or, and we'll call it dimensional weight. And so now every package, when you order something online, uh, the company that shipped it to you is charged something called dimensional weight, which basically just takes the, you know, how much air is in the box into account when, when they get charged for it. Okay. Interesting. So it's kind of a function of the physical weight and then the dimensions of the box and they have some exactly. equation that, that, that spits out a number there. Um, exactly. Okay. Okay. Got it. And so then everybody found themselves kind of starting to pay, pay more for shipping large boxes, um, and, and not having a solution. I mean, what, um, what was the status quo? So you mentioned they already had, you know, software that was helping with the packaging process. What was the status quo for the process at the time? Yeah. I mean, some, some companies had software for it, um, but that software required, you know, knowing the dimensions of the products that they were actually shipping, which, um, not many companies actually did. So it was as kind of low tech as like, you know, just relying on tribal knowledge. Um, I think one of the first companies we talked to when we set out to build this, they literally had just had post-it notes on the warehouse wall next to the pack stations of like, make sure you don't put, you know, this product in this box. And the, so some fairly low tech stuff. And I, you know, as, as time went on, um, these shippers started looking at kind of the simple algorithmic approach where, you know, if I'm shipping this phone, the, the math would say, okay, what's the total cubic volume of this? Is it less than the total cubic volume of the box? And then it would give the person at the pack station the AOK. Um, that's pretty basic. It's not, it's not acknowledging three dimensional space. It's, it's almost treating objects like a liquid. Um, so, that was creating a lot of problems for people because if you imagine an extreme example is, you know, a shovel may have a lower total cubic volume than a box. It doesn't mean it's not going to put a hole <laughs> right through it. Um, you know, it doesn't account for fragility or items being able to stack, nest, roll, all these things. So um, pretty, pretty low tech. And so this is really what, you know, a lot of the shippers that we had done work for and, you know, worked on projects with were they were just having to put too many custom guardrails around this kind of math that came baked into their warehouse software. Um, and so my, my co-founder, Pat, is a you know, brilliant engineer um, who's worked on other uh, kind of AI projects for med tech and all these things. And so we basically created an engine that plays uh, you know, 3D Tetris automatically. So every time a shipment comes to the pack station, our algorithm runs and then spits out a picture and instructions for how, you know, which boxes to pick, but also how those items should go in the box. Hmm. Yeah. I'm curious if there were any, I mean, you mentioned e-commerce already, but uh, just if we think about the dynamics in the market, I'm uh, imagining on, on the one hand, companies are kind of shifting from the, maybe this is already 20 years ago, but like we produce a lot of a few things. Um, towards we produce, you know, a lot of a lot of things. So uh, diversity of SKUs. Um, and then also, I don't know if this was already happening in uh, 2018, uh, but now you seem to have these almost, uh, I mean, for lack of a better word, kind of migrant workforces of like, okay, we need to rent, we need to hire three times as many people for two months to push through. Um, and when you talk about that tribal knowledge, right, that's just not going to exist when you're in that type of workforce. Are those new trends or were those already 20 years ago? Was it the same dynamic there? Definitely new in terms of how common it is. Um, but actually our first customer um, is a company called Lionel Trains. I don't know if you ever played with model trains as a kid, but um, they're an amazing company. They're like 100 years old, um, ton of history, um, but very like forward thinking when it comes to technology. Um, as you might imagine, they're not shipping a lot of or as many model trains in the summer. It's kind of a, a Christmas gift thing. So their entire workforce is it was pretty seasonal. Um, so there was just it was just too heavy of a lift to have to retrain um, these folks every single time. So you know how we we kind of came together and um, now we put up packing instructions and they don't their packers also don't have to worry about making a mistake because the instructions are are right there. 
Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the the business side here of um, Packurate. So, um, are you? I mean, Lionel Trains obviously it's a it's a B two C kind of shipping direct to consumer. Is that kind of your sweet spot? Do you also do um, do you do B two B environment shipping components and so forth? Or what's the what's the customer group look like? Yeah, kind of kind of everything. I mean, a lot of our B two B customers are like auto parts uh, companies. Um, so as long as there is some complexity, that's usually when we can provide some value. Um, definitely the vast majority of our customers are e-commerce shippers, uh, because, you know, there's a, there's a speed in which they need to fulfill, um, where mistakes are more likely to happen. And so if we can help put some controls around that, uh, and bring down the, you know, the average cost of their shipping, we can help with their margins. And so that, that's usually, um, what our customer looks like. Say you know, home goods is a, a pretty popular vertical for us. One of our first kind of large customers was uh, Crate and Barrel. Um, as you might imagine, they have a, a good degree of complexity. They don't just have one definition of fragile; they have a lot of different <laughs> concepts of what fragile means, so that you know their goods arrive intact. And so um, that was like really when the first time that our engine kind of got put through its paces and. And was you know we had to make sure it was production ready and could handle all of that. Oh, that's interesting. So then, yeah, because then it's not just the product I mentioned, but it's the product plus the packaging, and the packaging might end up being you know three times as as significant as the product. In some right? Ways. Yeah, the film material. You know, can this be stacked? Can it not when it's with a certain other item? Mm-hmm. You can really kind of go down the rabbit hole um, in in terms of what the constraints are. Uh, for an actual things that, you know, one thing tribal knowledge is good at is um, it's not really great at eyeballing three dimensional space, but it's really good at understanding what is appropriate. <laughs> you know, that's what humans are, are good at judging what's what's appropriate. Like if you're standing at a pack station, you can kind of intuit that you shouldn't put a bowling ball with a China uh, cup Um but you may have a hard time, you know, just being a human being with a brain that works the way that we do. You may have a hard time when you're under the under pressure to move product um, that this is the right box for the shipment. Um, it's it's pretty difficult to eyeball. Yeah, no, I'd love to get into um, how you how you build the algorithms for the the customers, and because I guess it is going to be a combination of um, kind of mathematics. And and then tribal knowledge, right? Uh, but uh, before we go into that, uh, just a, a bit more on the value proposition. Uh, so cost reduction, obviously, a big thing here. I'm curious about sustainability. I mean, this is a topic that uh, we've started seeing people talk about a lot more, and it's always a bit of a question, uh, situation by situation. Of is this something that we talk about, but it's priority number seven, or is this really driving decisions around how we operate? And what does it look like here? Because there's obviously an implication. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I'm actually not sure to what extent people are really making decisions based on this. Well, packing, I mean, really the cartons, uh, in an e-commerce business specifically, it's kind of the, the atomic level of your supply chain. Um, but what makes it kind of a special area to do any kind of optimization on is that you're basically everything related to the material, to the actual shipping, you're paying to pollute effectively. So anything you can do to, you know, shrink the box, reduce the material, um, the cost savings and the emissions reduction tend to scale one to one. Um, so if we're able to, you know, reduce your total, you know, average size of your packages by 14%, you're going to need 14% fewer trucks leaving your DC, um, on average over time. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a, I mean, that's really what, myself and my team get excited about is it almost we don't really care what the reason is uh that the customer has for for wanting to solve this problem it's kind of irrelevant because if you're if you're trying to cut costs by looking at this area you're also going to make things greener um but to answer your question we see a mix um we see some folks some companies are like really uh driven now by sustainability um in kind of a surprisingly, this may sound cynical, but surprisingly authentic way. So a a lot of these folks, like Crate and Barrel was like this. They didn't give any sign that they were looking for a marketing win. Um, They saw a problem and they were like, 
you know, uh, uh, extremely excited by the numbers that we were showing them about what they could achieve in terms of waste reduction. Um, on the other side, sometimes, you know, our, our kind of champion uh, at a prospect company, um, they will kind of reveal that their uh, hidden motive is sustainability, but they need help selling it up the chain uh, and, and putting it in terms of cost savings. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, any, end of the day, there's going to be a number of different stakeholders um, involved in the decision and they yeah, they might have different priorities. So it's it's good to be able to um, address that from a couple angles. Well, let's get into the the solution here. So, um, yeah, you were mentioning kind of tribal knowledge, and then obviously there's a lot of um, a lot of just mathematics involved here. Um, how does the solution work? How, how does it uh, cap? You know, how does it basically? Because uh, every every company is going to have unique priorities in terms of um, cost reduction, in terms of um, you know, quality assurance, etc. Um, and so I, I imagine you're going to have to be kind of customizing this or allow them to customize it. So what, what does that process look like? Yeah, so actually our our engine is accessed via a stateless API, um, and it's got all the features that all of our customers use in the API schema. So there's really no custom, I mean, very little custom development per uh, customer. Um, usually we'll sit with them and I'll try to understand their requirements, their tribal knowledge requirements. How do, how do you translate those into terms that our API would understand? Um, you know, the crate and barrel example, we don't have a fragile feature because, you know, that, that's too vague. So we work with them to kind of define those things in a way that, um, can be translated into the, the API. And, um, so yeah, so it's really simple. It's a single stateless API endpoint. Um, there's no configuration on our side because we don't want to save anything because we want it to be, we want to return a result in milliseconds. So everything about every shipment you have to put in every request, we do the math and then we send back the answer. Gotcha. So hundred percent cloud-based solution. Is that right? That's right. We have a couple on premise, but it's definitely the exception. Okay. Clear. So just that I'm understanding this, you have, um, um, you have your APIs that the customers interacting with. Um, you have your your kind of decision engine that's sitting in the cloud. Um, and then, uh, if we think about the implementation process, um, I guess there could be some circumstances where it's so clear that somebody I don't know a day in can basically be using the solution. And I'd imagine that there's other situations where companies need to kind of figure out how to make this you know how to uh, to some extent customize the software. Uh, so what what would that implementation process look like? Yeah, so there's a couple different like popular use cases. One is in WMS software, the warehouse management uh, system. Um, there's or a separate kind of packing station software. Usually at a pack station where there's a human being, you know, assembling these shipments, there's a screen, and they have to you know scan the items. Um, so the system can say, yep, you got the right items for that order. That's usually where our customers put the packing instructions that we return. Um, but the other use case that all of a sudden this year has become um, quite a bit more common is calling the API from the online shopping cart. Um, this is another kind of weird thing that uh, has remained kind of low tech, uh, and that is shipping estimates. Um, they've historically been like just totally basic math, like based on the number of items, but generally kind of divorced from what the actual cost of shipping is. Um, so we, we've seen a, quite a few e-com, uh, e-com shippers come in and say, let's make this shipping quote, uh, accurate, uh, based on how this thing's actually going to be packed. Um, so that's been kind of an interesting development. Um, yeah. and, and then, you know, beyond that, um, as we get more into integrating with automation, uh, machinery, um, we have one company called Hunter Douglas that uses our API to drive their box making machines. I don't know if you've heard of, of that company, but they make, uh, custom shades and blinds. Um, and previously they, you know, had to have an operator come over, measure the blinds that they were shipping and then type it into the the machine to make the custom shipping boxes for it. Um, but today now Packurate just automatically drives those things. So the right boxes are, are spit out at the right moment. Okay. So they're uploading like a CAD 
design file or something and, and ba you're making decisions based on that or what's the input data? Yeah, the input data. So um, at a minimum, we need item dimensions. Um, and if they're not using a, a machine uh, box dimensions, what, what cartons do you have available? Um, and then beyond that, there's item rules and business rules. And then our kind of big differentiator, um, you know, the reason why we kind of exist actually is because of our methodology, which is we found that the size of packages um, was an okay stand-in for lowest cost. So it stands to reason you make a box smaller, it's going to cost less. But we found it's not perfect. And so the way that uh, we wrote our algorithm is to optimize for cost directly. So what is that? That means uh, we're not just looking at trying to make stuff smaller in a three-dimensional space. We're looking at labor costs. What is the labor implication of opening a second box, um, even if the carrier rate tables seem to incentivize opening that second box? Um, what's the packaging material or you know emissions uh, implication of opening more than one or two boxes? Um, so all those things are kind of being reconciled at the same time. Uh, I would say... Uh, that's, that's kind of an advanced down the rabbit hole use case, but that's, that's why, um, a lot of the larger companies come to us at the moment. Yeah. So you have, uh, I think we've covered kind of retailers, three PLs. You also have four carriers here. Um, so I, I mean, carriers are, are not kind of a different uh, customer group entirely, but how would they be using the software? Um, they're more kind of, uh, referral partners um, because it turns out you know when you even if we're reducing their revenue on a per shipment basis they end up becoming more profitable because they can fit more packages into a single single trailer um, and because each of those shipments has a base cost um, they come out ahead so the, there's a reason why carriers are uh, incentivizing packing more efficiently it's not just because they want to collect uh, when you screw it up, it's because there's actually a financial reason why it's better for them if you're uh, packing more efficiently. Um, gotcha. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining because I'm <clears throat> kind of aware of innovations going on right now in the industry around, um, you know, packing solutions, especially around the topic of sustainability and how to reduce uh, material usage. So kind of creating... Um, packing materials that have a lot of volume with a small amount of material, for example. Um, and I'm curious, are you, you know, are you involved in that process of helping companies to decide not just um, from kind of a, you know, protecting the product and then obviously managing the size of the box, but also like if you use packing material X, that might, you know, give you a, um, a lower sustainability, you know, impact um, while still providing the, the protection you need and so forth. So, do you have these uh, these kinds of um, recommendation engine around also the the packing material into the algorithm? So yes and no. So we don't do anything related to packaging engineering. Um, so we're either working with the packaging engineers at these companies or bringing in a friendly kind of packaging engineering firm uh, to help us if that's part of the the project. Um, but the kind of besides the API, the other half of what we do is um, analysis. So we just recently released a new product we call Pack Simulate, uh, which we actually built on top of our existing engine, but it kind of turns it into a big data analysis um, uh, app. So a shipper can come in, upload historical shipping data, and in the background, the engine is running through millions of iterations of those shipments. And then at the end, it'll spit out an answer to uh, a certain question, the most common of which is which carton sizes uh, should I keep in stock? Uh, which is a fairly, you know, kind of simple question. Um, but it, this was another case of every time we would go into a medium to large size customer and they would say, okay, fine, we get it. You know, we, we believe you, this is going to save some money. We'll use the API, but how do we know if we have the right cartons? So it was another case of kind of building out something that, um, people were asking for. Yeah, I got it. No, it's interesting. Cause I can, I can imagine how this uh, solution would interface with different business systems, right? Because yeah, you are talking about inventory management here. So, uh, I, I mean, you, and you already mentioned kind of upfront um, order entry. Maybe you have data going into the CRM or you have data going into the order uh, order documentation. 
Um, you get into inventory, maybe there you're talking about the ERP system and planning. You obviously have kind of the WMS and, and the picking system and then the TMS and, and packing. Uh, so you have these different systems that you're interfacing with. Uh, I guess that's all through API. What, I mean, what does the um, what does the interface look like? And um, uh, is it? Uh, and then I guess in terms of the system integration, uh, I imagine if you're using APIs, that's all kind of built in. But what does that process uh, look like typically from a, a customer's perspective? Yeah. So the the first step is is what I mentioned, where we sit down with them and understand, like help them write the configuration so that they can do the rest of it themselves. Um, depending on what system they want to call the API from, um, it's not a pretty heavy, it's not a heavy lift. I mean, it's just the JSON API. Um, so most developers are fairly comfortable figuring out how to call one of those. Um, and so the average time to integrate, I think is two weeks last time I checked, um, even for the larger shippers. Um, so it's pretty simple, but we, you know, we, we provide this endpoint and we kind of consult on how it should be set up. But we definitely have plenty of customers that we've never actually talked to uh, because our all our documentation is public um, and they don't respond to my emails. They just put in a credit card and <laughs> they appear to be using it. So um, that that has been a, a, a blessing and a, and a curse uh, because we're a startup where we're so happy that people are signing up, but we would like that kind of relationship so we can understand how to get better in real time. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, you know one or two of the more uh, complex case studies, but maybe quickly on the the pricing. Um, I mean, it is uh, r- remarkably uh, economic, right? So uh, all the way from ninety nine dollars a month for a startup, uh, two forty nine a month for um, a professional, which is five thousand parcel requests per month, twenty five uh, pallets. Um, so that's kind of like a medium sized uh, medium sized. Uh, business and then and then obviously of the enterprise, um, what does that look like today in terms of your customer, um, your customer kind of segments? Are you working a lot? I mean, you've already mentioned a few of the larger enterprises you're working with, uh, but do you have a, a large volume of kind of small business, medium sized business uh, customers as well? I think we're like probably every other business where it's kind of the eighty twenty rule, where eighty percent of the revenue comes from twenty percent of the customers. Um, you know, most of the plans that are that you just read off, the public ones, um, mostly small shippers um, just getting started. Uh, but it was kind of important to us to make that available because the savings um, that you can get, they're the same percent or higher for smaller shippers. Um, and as long as their use case is simple enough, you know, we want as many, many uh, companies reducing their carbon footprint as possible. Um but on the high end, I mean, you know, the the kind of companies that are coming in now are not doing five thousand uh, shipments a month. They're doing you know four hundred thousand shipments a day. Um, so quite a quite a bit uh, a different scale there. So let's walk through a um, one of the more complex cases, and if we can kind of start from your first conversations with the customer, you know, understanding their needs, and then all the way through implementation towards day to day operations. Sure. Um, so a typical use case um, will be somebody, either a packaging engineer or a procurement people or somebody on the ops side in uh, fulfillment will have a hunch about something um, having to do with the way that they pack, the way that they're controlling packing, or the way that they're figuring out which cartons they should keep in stock at their pack station. Um, and so we will always start like the first step in in our sales process is always to do an analysis um, because it's pretty it's pretty easy so as long as they have the data of like what their item dimensions are what these you know these his- historical shipments were and we get samples of anything from 5000 shipments all the way up to you know 2 million shipments um, we we have tools um, where we can upload that and then it'll spit out a report of how accurate would have packed those things um, and they can, you know, drill down to see that we're not fudging the numbers by looking at individual shipments and see the instructions that we generated for those. Um, and so after that, it depends on how large the organization is. Sometimes we need to help build the business case, uh, for rolling this out across all their locations. Um, if we're not able to do that, uh, effectively, usually the, 
what happens is we get a pilot where they're saying, okay, fine, just put it in this location, see how it does. Um, we try to avoid that if we can, um, but that that's how the way it goes sometimes. Um, the other way that people come in is if they say, um, you know, maybe they're a group of data analytics people or, or packaging engineers, and they say some variation on the phrase, our shipping volume is up, but our profits are down. And we suspect it has something to do with the way, with how much cubic utilization we have. Um, and we like to hear that because that's pretty, it's like three steps ahead of, you know, a cold conversation about um, these problems. So that's that's how they tend to come in. And then, you know, it, after that, uh, they schedule the implementation. Um, with our new offering, Pack Simulate, it's great because we don't have to wait for integration. Like the WMS team, they don't have to put us on our schedule to do that. They, we just have to upload order data, and it'll tell them which cartons uh, they should. The procurement people should go get, and it still has a pretty profound impact on their their costs. Gotcha. Okay, so within two weeks, they're basically uh, they're basically operating. What ROI are you looking at? And then, you know, I don't know if you're able to kind of break that down in terms of what percentage is due to shipping rates, what percentage is due to labor efficiency, et cetera. But uh, how, how do you calculate ROI and what do you tend to aim for? So labor is something that we actually hear the most about from happy customers, um, but it's we haven't figured out a way to uh, make it generalized enough to claim anything. Um, it's easiest for us to focus on transportation costs and material costs. Um, so I, I think the average savings is somewhere in the realm of 50 to 60% more savings than kind of prior solutions on, on transportation. Um, in terms of corrugate, uh, we see an average reduction of one square foot uh, of cardboard per carton, just by on average choosing smaller ones. Um, so th those are the kind of the things we we tend to to key in on because they're the most simple to kind of explain. Three PLs care more about labor, um, so they're more likely. You know, when we first talk to them, they're more likely even to know off the top of their head what the labor cost is of allowing a packer to open a second box. Um, so that's we love that because we can kind of plug that in uh, to the analysis and and see what happens when we start messing with uh, some of the values. Yeah, got it, got it. Do you have any um, time to payback figures from prior cases? Uh, I mean, most of our customers pay you know on a metered basis per use. Um, so as long as you're doing you know a thousand shipments a month, it should be instantaneous. Um, pack simulates a little different because you're using it for various analysis projects. It's extremely computationally intensive. Um, so depending on what you're doing an analysis on that can maybe take a few months, uh, or, you, you know, up to a year, depending on what you're doing. Uh, but the API is, is right away. Cause we're, we're just plugging in and immediately changing the way that they operate. Yeah. And you mentioned that you, prefer not to run with pilots first. And I'm, I'm curious, it's always, you know, the pilot is always kind of an interesting beast because, um, you know, it's like, okay, how representative of normal operations is it? But it's it's kind of the natural step for a risk averse um, decision maker to take. Uh, but why why is it that you prefer not just to say, let's, let's run a pilot for three months and then decide uh, how you want to scale? I mean, it's mostly practical. If we have to do a pilot, you know, we kind of want to work with our champion to make it short, make it, you know, very clear what we're trying to prove here um, and make it no longer than three months. Um, we need to prove something beyond the initial analysis and the numbers that we delivered. That's absolutely understandable. But l let's keep this, you know, succinct and, and have a clear objective so we can move on. Um, I think, you know, just, just from a practical standpoint, priorities change. Um, in an organization. Mm -hmm. So trying to make sure that we're seizing on that excitement, uh, that we stay focused. And, um, you know, a lot of our customers have anywhere between five and, you know, 20 different distribution centers around the country. We don't want to stall out because there was like a change in management the six months later or something happened. So that's kind of why it's more of a, a practicality thing of getting this done. 
Um, and I know, you know, usually if our, our champions are fairly passionate about this because of the sustainability implications. And so they're, they're pretty supportive of this approach as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, though, that's a good point. So momentum is, is very important in uh, any kind of business decision. Right. Um, well, James, let's talk a bit about the future here. I know you raised, um, at least Crunchbase is telling me that you raised $2.2 million in uh, May as a seed round. So I, I guess that's allowing you to um, now um, be a bit more ambitious with the product uh, roadmap. Um, if you look over the next, let's say, 12 to 24 months, what, what does it look like? Is it is it rolling out a lot of new functionality? Is it moving into new customer segments? Is it geographic expansion? What are the priorities for you? Yeah, well, it's it's a few things. Um, our next round, well, I'll start with this. Our next round, uh, which will probably be somewhere towards the end of this year, um, will be focused on funding integration. Because right now, you know, we've got this stateless API and we're like, use it or don't, here it is, enjoy. Um, but we found especially like mid-sized customers don't have uh, the resources to do their own integration or can't prioritize it. So having some out-of-the-box integrations with e you know, software, shipping software, all these things, that's kind of stuff that we're setting up now, um, but we'll actually build it out uh, next year. Um, in the nearer term, you know, with Pack Simulate, we're suddenly, or I'm, I won't speak for the whole team, but I think they are too, we're suddenly kind of fascinated with this idea that the physical packaging could be so um, kind of reactive to the complexity of fulfillment, where if you change your carrier, and this is what we're finding in real time as, as new shippers use the platform, if you change your carrier or you change your product slightly, your box mix, the mix of cartons you have at your uh, pack stations should change as well. Um, there's never really been that kind of agility uh, to use a overused word, agility before when it comes to packaging. Um, so I, I'm finding that extremely exciting. And so I think the platform will move towards making it easier to acquire those cartons directly in the platform. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I mean, it's kind of uh, dead inventory is always a, a topic, right? If you just have a bunch of packages sitting somewhere in a, in a warehouse and nobody's used them, but uh, you haven't thrown them away because maybe you have to use them. Uh, but I, I imagine this is one of those, you know, one of those areas from a warehouse management or inventory management perspective that can just kind of go, no, you know, nobody really makes a decision because how do you make a decision, right? There's, yeah. there's a little bit too much uncertainty there. Absolutely. I mean, mo- I would say most shippers, most large household name brand shippers um, have not even done kind of the older school method of this, which is hiring a packaging, uh, you know, consultant to come in and do some, you know, uh, high level analysis and tell you which boxes you should swap out. Um, a lot of these companies haven't changed their cartons in like 10 years. Um, which is, is pretty crazy to me, especially cause they, you know, they're, they're watching these boxes go out the door with a thousand air pillows in them. And, and part of it is, you know, there's been turnover at every level of the company and they're, you know, they may think of changing their cartons, but then they're like, well, wait a second this was really important to buy this weird size carton for some reason at some point. I don't know why it's here and I'm afraid to get rid of it. Um, so it, it's kind of an interesting, you know, cartonization is not new, but this kind of carton optimization, carton mix optimization is new. So it's kind of interesting seeing how people have tried to deal with it uh, previously. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that, uh, especially for the medium sized businesses, uh, at some point in the future, if you have kind of almost an e-commerce uh, model of saying, we can help you to, I, you know, like a, a shopping cart, we can help you choose the right packaging, right? Because uh, big businesses are going to hire consultants or they're going to have a dedicated team that will do this. But small businesses, like we, we found this package, it seems to kind of do the trick, but maybe there's something that's uh, more robust, that's 30% cheaper. Um, we just don't know about it, right? Right. Um, uh, yeah, I can imagine that uh, that would be a useful, at least, uh, decision to help people with at some point in the future. Um, geographically, are you guys 100% focused on the U.S. right now? Most of our customers are here, uh, but not really. Uh, we've had more and more new prospects coming in from Latin America um, and in Europe, um, Canada. That's kind of been the extent of it so far, um, but we haven't really done any marketing outside of those areas either. 
Gotcha. Yeah, when you start to look into other geographies, do you have to consider um, regulation or uh, you know are there different taxes that start to impact uh, decisions and so forth, or is that not a factor? Yeah, the, I wouldn't say they have a whole lot to do with any decisions about which regions. It's more where does our current kind of balance of expertise lie? Um, we can create the most value right now for companies that are shipping using American carriers, um, you know, or American centric carriers. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, look at, you know, some of the legislation that's coming down the pipe in the EU um, and in other places where they're actually targeting the cubic utilization of boxes. And they're saying, you know, all e-commerce shipments must be at least 60% full. Well, that's another kind of like, well, what? What? I, I've never had to worry about this before. Um, and uh, so th- I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to help uh, shippers that are struggling with, um, you know, a lot of a lot of legislation, especially around scope three emissions um, related to shipping um, that feels like it's coming out of left field a little bit. I think for, for shippers that are barely, um, you know, just getting a handle on their existing operations. So um, we're going to just kind of follow where uh, the need is. Yeah, good. Makes sense. Uh, well, James, thanks for the conversation today. I mean, it looks like you're great building a, a great business. Uh, I always love these very focused businesses. So I think in 40 minutes, uh, we were able to really uh, cover cover a lot of topics. Um, anything that we didn't touch on that's important for folks to know? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, if you're a consumer, um, if you get a badly packed box, uh, let us know and we will politely poke the company that shipped it to you. Uh, but on another note, if, you know, in your e-commerce shipping, if it's not something you need urgently, consider picking a slower shipping option um, because that will result in less uh, pollution in general. Um, that, that's, that's, uh, that's my tip for those, those environmentally minded consumers out there. Yeah, great. And and for folks that want to follow up, uh, the website is uh, packurate.io. So P A C C U R A T E dot I O. Uh, James, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks so much, Eric. This was fun. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.